Brian, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now, uh, the defense minister of the Netherlands, I know it sounds like an oxymoron in a country that resisted Hitler for less than one single day, but they have a defense minister. Of course, being achingly politically correct, it's a woman defense minister. And she said today that the money they're putting into Ukraine is a cheap way to resist Russia. It's cheap, of course, only if you hate the Ukrainian people who are dying in vast numbers for the money that is being put in, in order that they can satisfy themselves that they are resisting Russia. That really is the way that NATO looks at this conflict, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, once again, thank you for having me on. It's always an honor and a pleasure. I think this is part of the veneer falling off of this entire proxy war the collective West has been waging against Russia in Ukraine from 2014 onward. Uh, it really has been a process of the West conditioning Ukraine into a proxy to use as a battering ram against the Russian Federation. And now we see this whole process coming full circle, all of the propaganda evaporating and, the, and their true colors finally showing. Uh, we've heard similar sentiments expressed in the United States. We've heard people in the U.S. Congress talk about how this is a great investment, how the Ukrainians will fight to the last man, and how this is going to ultimately deter China, but deter China from doing what? E existing? And uh, I think people uh, should pay attention and listen and believe their ears now that, that we hear uh, the actual people behind this proxy war finally finally saying what everyone else, what you and I have been saying for so many uh, months since this, this special military operation began, that this was a proxy war all along uh, at the expense of the Ukrainian people, not, not for or in defense of the Ukrainian people. Well, you're absolutely right about American uh, statespeople, if we can call them that. Uh, L Lindsey Graham, for example, he goes one better than the, the Dutch defense ministress. He says, as you've just alluded, that actually we are putting money in and weapons in for a huge loss of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians in order to deter China. So the people in Ukraine are dying for Taiwan. And the people who are paying taxes in all these ailing Western economies are paying money for Ukraine in defense of Taiwan. How's that for a three-dimensional chess? And, and then it's even worse when people actually understand the realities about the status of Taiwan, how even the U.S. State Department officially recognizes it as part of China, meaning that all of this antagonism toward China over Taiwan is actually the United States violating China's sovereignty and violating international law. The U.N. recognizes Taiwan as part of China. So really, it is one proxy war being waged against Russia to support uh, the beginnings of another proxy war to be waged against China. And both of these proxy wars are fought uh, without justification. And it's a continuation of what we've seen the collective West do everywhere from Afghanistan to Iraq and from Libya to Syria. And now it's spread into Eastern Europe. Maybe you could say spreading into Eastern Europe again after Serbia. And now East Asia is under threat. The, uh, the situation on the diplomatic political battlefield is now going very badly for NATO. That's for sure. Uh, Joe Biden looks like a dead duck uh, by next week. Donald Trump might be the Speaker of the House of Representatives. I'm not making that up. It's a real live possibility now. Not many people believe that Biden will fight and win uh, the presidency next year. The new Prime Minister of Slovakia won his election on the explicit platform 
of no more support for the war. The Polish government, which was once in the vanguard uh, of uh, involvement in Ukraine, is now under fear in a general ele pre-general election campaign, uh, distancing itself so fast that it's all a blur. One doesn't know what they mean, what they don't mean, but the one thing's for sure, it's all bad news for Zelensky. And then we find his wife spending a million dollars, one million one hundred thousand dollars, to be precise. I've just looked at the receipt uh, for jewels in Cartier in New York. It all has the feel uh, uh, of something, a house of cards about to fall. Precisely. That, that, that is uh, exactly what is happening. And all of this political turmoil we see unfolding across the collective West. Uh, we hear pundits in the West claiming that this is Russia dividing, dividing the West, dividing Ukraine's allies against each other. But in reality, it is the fundamental lies uh, that this entire conflict have been built on. They're, they're unraveling and with it, all of these I guess you could say alliances or at least relationships built on perpetuating this proxy war in Ukraine against Russia. And it's only going to get worse. Uh, the situation on the ground in Ukraine, the so-called offensive has been uh, raging for four months. They have, it has made no progress at all against Russian positions. The West is running out of ammunition and weapons. They do not have the industrial capacity to make more. They they cannot sustain this conflict. And, and so what are they going to do when they run out of weapons, they run out of ammunition? Uh, the US at least can continue printing money out of thin air. But if you have nothing to buy with that money, what good does it do you? So now we see political turmoil. We see politicians uh, turning uh, toward their self-preservational instincts. And it's only going to continue unraveling into chaos in, in the West. And we've seen this again many, many times. We saw this all unfold regarding Afghanistan, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, uh, we, uh, we had the, the wife, former wife of the great Muhammad Ali on the show uh, on, on Sunday, and I was thinking a lot about Ali's last great triumph over George Foreman, rope-a-dope, where he leant on the ropes and soaked up the punishment from the fearsome George Foreman before exploding and, and dispatching him in a, 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 I promise you, an epiphany of joy uh, for most of us, certainly for me. Uh, isn't that what Russia's doing now? Rope-a-dope. Uh, they have a triple line of defense along the territories they have taken. Uh, the Ukrainians are not going to even reach the first line of those defenses. Never mind, breach them and get through to more. Uh, is that not a metaphor that you can recognize that at some point, Russia is going to spring forward, uh, just like Muhammad Ali, and uh, land some knockout blows. A absolutely. That is exactly what we're seeing. And um, this so-called progress that Ukraine is making, taking a, a handful of villages, and if you look at the maps, detailed maps, you will see that it's still taking place all within the security zone ahead of Russia's uh, layered main defenses. Uh, at the same time, Ukraine has exhausted its offensive potential. They had a finite amount of artillery and artillery ammunition, of armored vehicles, of tanks and armored personnel carriers, infantry fighting vehicles. And they've gone through the majority of all of this. And the, the West simply has no more to give them. There was a, def a deficiency even before the offensive was launched. And at the same time, the West is running out of weapons to supply Ukraine. Amid this offensive and onward, Russia has expanded its own military uh, industrial production. And these are facts that you and I have talked about for months on this show. And now these are facts that finally the New York Times is reporting in the pages of its newspapers. We can read about how uh, Russia is making seven times more uh, arms and ammunition than the collective West, not just the US or Europe, but them together. 
No, I mean, you've got to hand it to Putin. Uh, he's picked two new speakers in a week, uh, a new speaker in the Canadian Parliament and a new speaker uh, coming up in, in the United States, because that's the kind of absurdity they still uh, bleat, isn't it? Uh, anything that goes wrong for them is uh, Putin propaganda, misleading people and so on. And that's the basis on which uh, they then move to close down uh, voices uh, that uh, they don't like because they're reaching more and more people uh, with an alternative view on the war. I mean, the game's up for these people, even if they have not yet conceded it. Absolutely. And we're we're all in danger of that. So we, we can see the desperation setting in. And I, I remember many, many years ago uh, when I was much younger and I remember the West always saying about these so-called dictatorships and how them banning media in their country, how that was always a sign of weakness. And now we see the West leading the world in censorship, banning media. Uh, they've uprooted all Russian media entirely within their borders. Uh, they're planning on doing the same thing with Chinese media. And and what is the reason for this? Is it because Russia and China are saying anything that is untrue? Uh, I just uh, explained how the New York Times is now saying things that we have been saying for many months, things that had been labeled as Russian propaganda. So uh, it is, it is absolutely desperation setting in. They're not looking at the fundamentals that are creating this and driving this problem. And until they do that, the desperation will only grow because their problems will only grow. I mean, the end game uh, is not clear in the fog of uh, war, and much of it will depend on how far uh, Russia wants to go. But my mind's eye tells me uh, that the the end game will be approximately half of Ukrainian territory, including all of the coast and all of the east of the Dnipro, will be new parts of Novorossiya. Uh, they will effectively be part of Russia. And then the rest, it's inconceivable that the Russians could leave uh, a NATO statelet, however much of a stump it was, uh, in being. So there would have to be regime change in Kiev. Otherwise, you'd get what you've got in, in Kosovo, which is effectively NATO-occupied stump statelet, which can be activated at any point, which it currently is being activated in Kosovo, uh, to cause problems for in that case, Serbia, in this case, Russia. So it doesn't just end with the partition of the country, does it? It would have to end with a government in Kiev that was friendly to Russia and entirely neutral and for all time. Yes, I, I think that's a, a very reasonable assessment. Of course, nobody can predict the future, but we've seen many Russian leaders begin to hint toward this this type of outcome. Uh, we have to remember also that even while this conflict rages within Ukraine, there are many other factors unfolding out, outside. Uh, geopolitically, we, we are watching multipolarism rise. We're watching US-led unipolarism fade. The dollar is weakening. Uh, the uh, economies and industries of the multipolar world are surpassing the collective West. And when you add all of those things up with the situation taking place within Ukraine's borders and uh, Russia and Ukraine fighting this conflict, I, I think all of these things will drive the, the ultimate outcome. I think the West is going to be pushed into a corner where it's going to have to make a decision. Uh, we see that the, the tighter they try to grip onto Ukraine, the more everything starts to unravel, eventually I think they're going to have to realize there, there are limits to their power. They're going to have to negotiate finally in good faith with Russia uh, all the way up until now they have not. 
Uh, but I don't think they're going to be able to get away with that anymore. They're not going to be able to get away with it because Russia will not let them. And I think even the internal factors within the West will no longer make this plausible. Lastly, Brian, and I'm always grateful for your time, especially given the hour for you. I've just made a film about Taiwan. Uh, it's in its final uh, editing stages now. Uh, what do you see as the overarching, it's 74 years now since the People's Republic, uh, they're very patient uh, people. And I pose the question in my film, uh, will China wait for the apple to fall from the tree uh, or will it feel that it has to shake that tree before uh, the Americans turn it into a fortress that is an actual threat to any reunification ever uh, with uh, China. How do you see the relative balance uh, of these two approaches right now? I, I think that's a very good and important question. China has been extremely patient. Many people might not know this, but the United States actually has troops stationed in Taiwan. And th that is the ultimate provocation to uh, acknowledge that Taiwan is part of Chinese territory, but then to station troops there, knowing that you have no approval at all from Beijing to do that, uh, to openly and constantly promote separatism in Taiwan, uh, again, while also having a one China policy. So the U.S. is doing absolutely everything it can to provoke China. I think the reason why China has not allowed itself to be provoked is because they understand that time is on their side. Even the the most uh, the, the worst type of provocation imaginable, I think they understand that in the long term, what the U.S. is doing is not sustainable. Even if they were to try to turn Taiwan into some sort of fortress, I think eventually uh, in order to avoid war and the destruction of Taiwan, because frankly, that is what the U.S. is talking about and planning for. I, I think they will endure a lot in, in order to avoid conflict. They have Taiwan's best interests in mind. The U.S. does not.